Great Center Factor Station. So, everyone, oh, good evening and welcome to Daegu, South Korea. And tonight's live Q&A with the Contessa, travels with the Contessa, is going to be focused on Korea. So a lot of you said you couldn't attend the live session, but you sent me questions anyway. So tonight we are going to be delving into my tips and tricks for traveling through Korea in response directly to your questions. Now, for those of you who don't know, Korea is really the hidden gem of Asian tourism, in my opinion. There are not nearly as many people coming from the West to visit Korea as there should be. Most of you who are from the West, most Westerners, I should say, uh, if they think of Asia, they think of China and the Great Wall and Beijing and the Forbidden City. They think of Tokyo and its insanity. They think of um, Mount Fuji. They think of other parts of Japan. They think of Thailand. They think of Vietnam. They think of Cambodia. All of those countries will pop up in most people's minds before they even consider Korea. So, um, let me try to tell you this evening by answering these questions why it is you should come to Korea. So first off, a lot of people asked me about getting to Korea. Um, now, <laughs> um, if you're coming from the United States, there are, especially now that we're past the pandemic, travel is in full swing again, guys. There are dozens, if not 100 airlines now flying flights from the United States to Korea, either directly or connecting. So it's not hard to get flights anymore. If you are US military though, you have an added benefit that other people don't have. And that is something called space available flights. Um, so if you are active duty military, US military, if you are um, a spouse of an active duty member, if you are a retiree or a spouse of a retiree, you can take advantage of what is called space available flights, space A flights. And these are basically free flights. You have to pay um, like taxes or the cost of the meal or something to come to Korea. It's like $26 a person. And you can actually get on these flights for free. Now you have to go to space available, um, which is on uh, it's a mobility command thing. AMC, go to the AMC website and look it up and you can get hooked, connected with flights. There's one flight in particular that flies from Seattle, Tacoma International Airport, SeaTac, directly to Osan, which is an American Air Force base in Korea. And you can, well, it's not nonstop, but it's a direct flight. You will probably stop in Japan, unfortunately, at the base there for several hours. And I say unfortunately, because you won't be allowed out of the terminal. It's not like you get to go to Japan too. And you'll have to wait in the terminal and it will suck because the terminal is this tiny little, tiny little thing with no amenities and the seats have arms on them so you can't lay down or rest. And there will be lots of unhappy children probably who are grumpy from such a long flight. And you'll have to wait in the terminal before you can get back on the plane and carry onward. But to save yourself a thousand plus dollars, it might be worth it. So for those who don't know about it, space available. Remember, there are different categories. Um, so active duty is active duty soldiers at category three. Spouses unaccompanied are at category five. Retirees and retiree spouses are at category six. So that's kind of who did, that's how they determine who gets on the flights. So if you are category three and there's no category twos ahead of you, then it's just a question of who signed up first. Um, and of course, seasonality matters. So going during PCS season, you are unlikely to get any spots on these flights because people who are PCS permanent change of station, people who are transitioning, moving with the military, obviously get priority on these flights. So summer, PCS season and summer travel, you're only likely to make it on if you're alone or if you have special paperwork that bumps you up in, in the, it's called an emotional mental leave support or something like that, EML, right? So if you're not taking advantage of Space A, you should be. Look it up, do more research on it because it's a whole in-depth topic. I could do an entire hour thing just on space available travel. But if you're military or retired military US, you can take advantage of this as a great way to get to Korea. Now you'll have to get to SeaTac commercially, and then you might have to wait a couple of days to actually make a flight. But even with a couple of days in a hotel, you'll probably still save big bucks over the cost of flying to Korea, especially if you're a family. Now, airfares right now, guys, I hate to say this, airfares have just gone crazy. They've gone through the roof. Um, and so it's just, it's, not a good time to travel anywhere, not just Korea. 
you know, what used to be a $700 round trip flight is now easily starting at a $1,200 round trip flight for economy class, <laughs> not business class, not premium economy for steerage packed in like a sardine. So that's just the way it is. My tip there to go to Korea is to book in advance, as far in advance as you can. You will get a much better deal. Now, that being said, um, <sighs> points. Okay, some of you, I've had some very positive responses to my videos, my travel vlogs, and my reviews, and I've had some, oh my god, vilely vitriolic, venomous responses to people who I think maybe believe me to be a trust fund baby with all this money and I'm just snobbily reviewing this. No, <laughs> no, guys, I am. I come from a solid middle class background and uh, what I have I've earned. I have not been given it by anyone. And I travel business and first class through points, through credit card points. Um, I play the points game and I play it hard. And one of the reasons I can do that, and this is to all of my US military viewers and military spouse viewers, I can get a lot of these really high end travel reward credit cards for nothing, for a song. Um, and that's that's one of the benefits of being active duty. American Express waives the annual fee so you can get the Amex Platinum, which is now a $695 a year annual fee for free. And you can big sign-up bonuses. I get Chase waives the fee for annual fee. City waives the annual fee above $95. So if you get one of their lower end cards, you still have to pay the annual fee. So those three, those three credit card companies waive the annual fee on all of their cards for active duty US military and spouses. And so, you know, the sign-up bonuses alone are sometimes, are at least a one-way business class ticket from one hemisphere to the other, and sometimes a round trip, depending on how big the bonus is. So you might want to really consider starting to play the credit card game if you want to travel in luxury without, um, you know, having to pay thousands of dollars per ticket. Now, I do occasionally, and I mean like once a year, splurge and pay outright for a business class ticket only if I can find a good deal. But if I can't find a good deal, then I use my points. And I have enough points that I can fly round trip, I earn enough points, that I can fly round trip several times a year. Because guys, I put all of my purchases on my reward credit cards. I don't use cash if I don't have to. Because honestly, every single purchase translates to money for me, to a currency with which I can buy, get outsized value by purchasing these business class tickets. And first class, I've flown first class four times, five times in the last year in the last 10 months, in fact, all on points. I had to pay for the, the fees and taxes, and sometimes that was crazy expensive for what it was, but still cheaper than buying the first class ticket outright. So big tip, especially if you're active duty military, but even if you're not, play the points game. But treat the credit cards like a debit card. That means you don't buy on credit. You only buy exactly what you would normally buy every month, you pay it off at the end of every month. You do not carry balance. Do not wander down the path of carry debt. I would only do that for something that actually has an actual value generating object attached to it, meaning real estate. <laughs> that is the only thing I've ever gone into debt for. I've never gone into debt for anything else, not my university education, not um, cars, nothing. Always paid 100% cash for all of that. So college education is thanks to a very generous father who paid, covered what my scholarships didn't. Thank you, thank you, daddy. <laughs> um, but otherwise, otherwise, you know, I've pay off my credit cards every single month and reap the benefits from the points and all the perks that come with them. So especially for military, big tip, get into the reward credit card game, drop a note in the comments below if you'd like to know more about that. Um, and, you know, maybe I'll do a live chat just on that, maybe. Okay, so once you're in Korea, getting around, one of the questions was, how do I get around Korea? <laughs> well, Korea is, first off, not a very big country by virtue of the fact that the northern half is now a separate dictatorship governed by a crazy megalomaniacal dictator, some people call the Red Pharaoh. Um, and so the vast majority of what used to be Korea 
is now North Korea. South Korea is actually maybe a third of what was Korea as was by landmass. But South Korea is the democratic, peaceful, um, human rights respecting part of the equation. So good thing. Also very technologically advanced. I mean, infrastructure is super sophisticated here. I wish the United States had the kind of infrastructure, transport infrastructure that Korea has. Korea has an amazing train system that's cheap, fast, efficient, and almost always on time. They have a public um, bus, they have a bus system that is short and long distance, that is also inexpensive, on time, comfortable, clean, and safe. Trains are also. And taxis here, especially for those of us who earn US dollars or European currencies, excuse me, European currencies or UK currencies. Taxis are super cheap here. I mean, we can go six, seven kilometers in a taxi and it will only cost us $7. In Europe, that would be unimaginable. So, you know, the way I travel, uh, we don't even own a car here, actually, on purpose. Uh, we use trains for long distances. Um, and then when we get to the closest train station to the point where we're going, and then we'll take a bus or a taxi from po for point to point transit, depending on what the situation is. Um, so we don't use a car and you don't need a car either. You really don't. A lot of Americans here do buy cars because they're used to the convenience. But here's a tip about Korea. There are too many cars for the amount of road and parking that is actually available. So frequently the cities are, are it's gridlock. It's you're crawling along. You will get places sometimes faster walking than you will driving, um, especially with the way the traffic lights work here. So. I don't recommend a car. Now, if you're going someplace, here's what we do, my husband and I. When we do want to visit a place that isn't accessible by public, easily accessible by public transit, we rent a car for that specific need. Because why should I pay insurance and maintenance um, and possibly for parking, although we don't wouldn't have to in this apartment complex, but possibly for parking for a vehicle we hardly ever use, whereas it's just cheaper just to rent a vehicle for the specific needs when we need it. And it's definitely cheaper than buying a car to you know, pay for public transit for all those other times when we do need it. Um, yeah, do need to get around and want to get around. But really, uh, you know, we do take trains the majority of places. And um, for trains, you can, people say, well, what about the language barrier? That's another question. What about the language barrier? Okay, Korean. Um, Yes, is one of the most difficult languages in the world to learn. It's not hard to learn some of the common expressions. So, you know, a, the, one of the more common greetings is annyeonghaseyo, which literally means peace be with you. <laughs> it's a kind of a Buddhist thing. Uh, it extends back a long time, um, even though no one thinks of it that way anymore. Um, so it's easy to learn a couple of, of common expressions greetings, thank you, and I do really recommend that if you're going to come to Korea, you take the time to just learn those couple of expressions. But one of the nice things about Korea versus China or Japan is that Korea has an alphabet and uses an alphabet, a proper alphabet with letters, not pictograms. So you don't have to learn a thousand symbols in order to competently read Korean. There's 26, 20, depends on the vowels. There's some combination vowels, like 30 letters total really that you need to learn in order to read Korean. And um, it doesn't take long, it takes an hour maybe to learn the alphabet. And then at least you can read the signs. Now, you might not understand what the signs say, <laughs> but at least you can read them. And the reality is that in most places in Korea, the, the traffic signs, the travel signs, signs pointing to places, 90% of the time are going to also be in English. So you don't have to worry about not understanding the signs. Whereas, when I was in Japan, I was often um, met with a situation where there were no signs in any of the eight languages that I can read, <laughs> um, which says something, <laughs> including Korean, by the way. Um, and China, China, oof, China, you almost need a fixer to get around in China outside of the major cities. Whereas in Korea, you don't need any of that. You can get around all of Korea without speaking Korean with any kind of real fluency because people here are friendly. They will try to communicate with you however they can. And now 
even though I'm a translator and I shouldn't be saying this, the interpretation apps are actually getting scarily good. So you can actually get an app for your phone. There are various interpretation apps and translation apps. Translation is written, interpretation is spoken that you can get for your phone that will allow you to read whatever signs don't happen to be in English pretty competently. So there are also though, for the major transit uh, transport services, there are many websites are also in English. So um, the site for the Korean train is let's let's co-rail. Let me see if I can put that here in the in the chat. Is let's co-rail, and um, this is live. So I should be able to, yeah. Let's co-rail. So I'm putting this in the chat. Let's co-rail.com. Okay, that is the site specifically for. Uh, the train station for trains in English in Korea and you, it's no it's very easy to use you'll figure it out it does have some quirks like um, you know it, it resets if you go back to restart your search it resets everything and you have to re-enter all of your origin and destination cities but it's entirely in English all the cities are in English the scheduling is in English payment is in English really good website and there's an app there is also a let's co rail app um, and you can get that in the App Store. You can get that in the App Store and it, you can also switch its language to English by going to the little cog. Even if you don't understand the Korean, if you go to the cog, then uh, you click on the cog, you can set the language to English. So that's how we buy our train tickets. You can buy them at most of the major train stations from a person, except on certain holidays. For instance, I just saw a, um, a message from Co-Rail saying that during Chuseok, the Korean Thanksgiving celebration, Thanksgiving harvest celebration, there will be no person selling tickets at any of the train stations and that you will have to buy those tickets perforce online. So good to have that Co-Rail app or to go to the website, let's co um, uh, for buses, it's much more complicated and much less easy because the buses are operated by private bus services, so you just kind of have to go to the bus station. But you can look up the bus station for any given city on Google or um, then I'm going to talk in a moment about some of the Korean websites that you should use, search sites that you should use, and you'll be shown where it is. And for the most part, um, you don't necessarily need to buy tickets in advance for the buses. And buses going to anywhere run multiple times a day and the coach buses are comfortable and big and clean and quiet and you know nothing not so those of you like me who've had horrifying greyhound experiences i have never never in korea had anything close to the experience that i had on going gone greyhound from raleigh durham to um asheville north carolina last year i haven't published that video yet but i should because holy cow the bus literally smelled like rotting food, and that's because there was rotting food. Oh, and human fecal matter because the bathroom needed to be cleaned. Anyway, so buses, trains, metro. Three of Korea's cities have metro systems. Seoul, of course, 25 million people, has the most extensive. Its metro system is amazing and will generally get you wherever you're going faster than driving for certain, generally. Um, and it's cheap. The metro in Korea is super duper cheap. Daegu, also where I live, also has three whole, three whole metro lines. Um, one of them is an L train, a fun L train, so you can actually see the city as you go around, and that's really nice, actually. And then Pusan has, is in between Seoul and Daegu in size, it's the second largest city in Korea, and it has a fairly extensive metro as well. Um, and there is an app called the Korea Subway app. The Korea Subway app, there we go. The Korea Subway app um, is excellent. You can change the city, and it's also available on Play Store, or probably on Apple, the Apple Store. I mean, I'm not, in, I'm sorry guys, I think Apple products are terrible for many reasons. Not necessarily the quality, but the whole business model is behind them. So I know nothing almost about them, but I'm pretty certain it's available on the Apple Store. And 
I really cannot high recommend the Apple, or excuse me, Korea subway enough. You can change cities to the different cities. You can actually set your starting point and your end point. You can change the amount of time that you'll be given for transfers. The app will actually tell you which door you should be at for fastest transfer. So which train car you should actually get on so that you make the best, most efficient transfer. It will tell you where the closest exit is. So which car you need to be on so you're close to the closest um, metro station exit. Really handy. So Korea subway app is definitely a must have. And then you will need a, what's called a T-Money card. A T-Money card. And you can buy T-Money cards at any of the convenience stores. GS25, CU, 7-Eleven. Yeah, that's right, 7-Eleven. Uh, you can buy a My Story also. Or sorry, excuse me, not My Story, Storyway. You can buy T-Money cards there. And you also have to, you can also put money on them there. If you're in Seoul, you can reload T-Money cards at the, in the metro stations. If you are in Daegu, you cannot. And I don't remember in Busan whether there were uh, T-Money card recharging machines or not. But you can definitely recharge them at any of these convenience stores. You go in, you hand them the card, but you cannot use a credit card to recharge, to either purchase <laughs> or recharge T-Money cards. You must have cash. So you must have won on your person, not dollars, won. So tip, make sure that you have, you bring cash with you, won to the convenience store to either purchase or buy your T-Money card. And those T-Money cards can be used in a variety of places where you can't use cash and you can't use credit card either. You can use them on the buses, all the buses, Korea-wide. You can use them in the metros. You can use them and vending machines, interestingly. We've used them to get water in the palace gardens in Seoul from vending machines in the middle of this gorgeous Joseon <laughs> Park garden, palace garden. So T-Money card is a must-have. And also note that if you have children or minors, you can actually get the T-Money cards calibrated for children's pricing, which is less than adult pricing. It's so, being a child in Korea is great. It's so inexpensive. They really try to calibrate the prices much lower for children. So when you get the T-Money card, make certain, if it's for one of your children or a child, make certain they give you the right calibration for it. And when you go to recharge it at these recharging stations, also make sure that you recharge, you chose children instead of adult for recharging, although I don't think it matters on the recharge, it only matters if you're buying individual tickets, because the card automatically determines the fare. Okay, forget what I just said. If you're buying a ticket, make sure you choose children. Same thing for trains. By the way, uh, 13, I think up to 13 years old, but 13, 13 and over is an adult ticket, but under 13 is a children's ticket, and it's like ha literally half price of an adult. So make sure that when you're buying your tickets, if you're buying for children 12 or under, that you choose children instead of adult and save yourself a lot of money. Okay, so, so much for getting around Korea. Um, oh, taxis. You can use credit cards and taxis. I recommend using credit cards and taxis, excuse me, especially because then if you're getting, if you have a reward credit card, then you get points. And by the way, the American Express Green and the Chase, uh, the green card and the Chase Sapphire Reserve are the best cards for taxis. You get three times the points on taxi purchases or transit, all transit, trains too. So those two cards are your good ones for transit, including taxis. Tip on getting a taxi. Now, 99% of Korean drivers are, or drivers in Korea are super scrupulous and will not try to cheat you. But, in Korea and in other countries, not just Korea, I have had taxi drivers try to play the not turn the meter game, you know, try to not turn, try to play the not, no meter game. And then when we get to the destination, try to charge me, you know, give, quote me a price that is absurd. So when you get in the car, make certain you tell them to start the meter because that makes it a legitimate transaction and then they have to abide by the meter. So caveat emptor or driver, caveat rider, <laughs> um, make certain that your taxi driver starts the meter. And that's any country, not just Korea. 
actually, I've had that problem mostly in Italy. It, it, you know, especially in Rome, God, those drivers are so corrupt. They won't even run the meter at all. And no one will make them run the meter either. So, okay, uh, transit. Now, um, people asked me about food. <laughs> Is the food spicy in Korea? Yes. <laughs> Um, much, many of the dishes are spicy, even if they're not labeled as such, which means that if a dish is explicitly called spicy, you better like spice. That's because here, gochu, the red pepper is, it's practically a food group, really. It, it really is. So um, there are, of course, non-spicy dishes. There are ways you can enjoy your food without it being spicy. Um, but many dishes are inherently like this the red pepper fermented red pepper paste is built into the base of the dish so you can't just get it not spicy in fact i don't know how thai curry in america can ever be not spicy because the fundamental core of thai curry paste is green or red pepper the green thai thai green or thai red peppers so i'm not certain <laughs> how you can make that not spicy. But same thing in Korea, gochujang, the fermented red pepper paste is a fundamental part of most dishes. So you're not really going to be able to get dishes made with that not spicy. If you don't like spice though, you can get bimbimbap and that's a mixed vegetables and rice. So it's got this lovely base of steamed rice and then these beautiful rainbow arrangement of different, um, and I'll put that here, bim which literally means mixed vegetable rice. These beautiful little piles of carefully prepared vegetables, different kinds. Sometimes you, if you go to a high-end place, it's going to be wild forest vegetables that are you know, seasonally available. If you go to a quick place, it's going to be kind of more the common sprouts and carrots and lettuce and that kind of thing. And there's raw bimbimbap and there's, but not the rice is raw. The rice is always cooked, <laughs> no crunchy rice for you, but the vegetables will be raw or Sometimes they'll be sauteed. Sometimes they'll be blanched and mixed with sesame oil and garlic. Um, sometimes you can get it with an egg, cooked egg. Sometimes it's served in a hot pot so hot that if you touch it, you will lose skin down to the bone. But for that, they put a raw egg over top of it. And then when you mix it, the egg kind of cooks and mixes with everything and becomes its own sauce. There's also beef tartar um, bimimbap, which is very popular in Jeonju. So it's, you know, minced fresh raw beef. And no, you will not get food poisoning from raw beef that comes from cows that have been A, treated well, slaught B, slaughtered in a clean environment, C, properly handled after their death, and D, freshly, relatively fresh. You will not get foodborne contagions from beef that meets these conditions. And in Korea, ta beef tartare always meets those conditions. So I do recommend giving it a try, even if it sounds scary, actually. I rather like raw beef. It is not slimy, it is tasty. Um, so that there's all sorts of bimbimbap, but the way you can control its spice is by not adding the gochujang bimbimbap sauce that is often served with it on the side. Um, if it's not served on the side, then it's just served in a little lump on top and you can just quietly remove that if spice is too much for you. Anyway, bimbimbap is definitely a dish you should try if you're here. Um, dak galbi, I'm putting that here, is another dish I highly recommend everyone try. Chunton is uh, a, a city up in sort of northeastern-ish Korea, northeastern-ish South Korea. Um, and it's delicious. It dak galbi literally means chicken ribs, and you all are probably now looking at me <laughs> in a sconce because chicken ribs? Yeah, it's not like that. So dak galbi came from a time, as far as I can tell, the history of the dish is that it developed in a time when there, people were too poor for beef galbi or, or teji galbi, so beef ribs or pork ribs. And so they came up with a dish and they called it galbi to make people feel like they were eating something that was more luxurious than it really was. That's what I've been given to understand is the origin of the dish. But it is, in my opinion, a scrumptious dish. Now, that galbi is spicy by its nature. No way around that. You can make it more spicy than it will be on its own, but that galbi is basically chicken. When I make it, I use chicken legs because I think, or thighs, because I think that's the best meat of the chicken. Marinated in this sweet, savory 
uh, spicy marinade of garlic and sesame oil and rice wine and gochujang, that fermented pepper paste, um, and ginger, and a little bit of, when I make it, I make it with honey, although a lot of people make it with corn syrup here in Korea now, sad. Or rice syrup is the traditional one. And that's marinated in that. And then that is stir fried up in combination with garlic and perilla leaves, which are this, this lovely spade shaped leaf that has a citrusy peppery taste. Um, and green onion and tok, which are those yummy chewy rice cakes, rice dumplings and Korean sweet potato, which is not sweet like American sweet potato, really. And that's all fried together. This yummy melange, especially as the fat starts to cook out of the chicken thighs, especially if it still has skin on. And then the trend these days with the dak galbi is to put grated, at the end of its cooking, grated mozzarella cheese on top and let that melt into it. And then you eat that wrapped in little leaf, little leaf wraps Specifically, the perilla leaves are my favorite. And then when half of it's eaten, you can ask them to bring rice and they will bring rice and stir fry the rice into the leftovers right in the pan. And the rice will absorb up all of the yummy drippings from the oil and the, the cheese. And that will all just get fried together in this beautiful, beautiful Maynard reaction. So that's Doc Albi, highly recommended. Um, of course, if you know, if you're new to Korea, you'll want to try bulgogi, um, which actually literally means fire meat. Bul is fire, kogi is meat. <laughs> and that's because originally this was a dish that was, it was grilled meat. It was grilled beef, marinated grilled beef. And there are still some versions of bulgogi that are fire grilled, um, but that will be indicated on the thing. The most common thing is uh, it's marinated in a sweet and savory, but not spicy. So bulgogi is really good for people who don't like spice. It's marinated in this delicious combination of sesame oil and rice syrup traditionally, um, and garlic and ginger um, and rice wine. And then that, um, and then for, or, or sometimes not, uh, the more traditionally is not rice syrup, but uh, pear, Asian pear. Uh, which tenderizes it and adds sweetness to it. The acids tenderize it, the pear naturally sweetens it. And then that is stir fried up with onions, green onions, um, and sometimes regular onions, and then served with rice. Now, there's a lot of versions of this dish that are just gloppy sweet and disgusting, in my opinion. But the traditional, traditional bulgogi is very good and an absolute must try if you haven't tried it. Of course, then there's soups. Korea is really a broth nation. In fact, on Netflix, I recommend this series. It is called, in English, it is called Broth Nation. And it's an exploration of traditional local foods, most specifically, usually from a broth perspective. So soups and stews and braises. And this, this set of three Korean celebrities from different fields travel around Korea, they're all from Seoul, <laughs> and they travel around Korea and explore things they've never had before because they're all from Seoul. And so they know nothing about, at the beginning of this, or very little, relatively little, about the dishes outside of Gyeonggi-do, of, of the region, the province that is Seoul. So they, um, it's a really interesting show, don't watch Hungry. <laughs> because everything just looks so good. And, you know, they go to really remote parts to explore some really amazing things. So highly recommend checking out Broth Nation. It might also give you some ideas on dishes you want to try that I can't, I can't go into all the dishes. Korea has such an amazing in-depth culinary uh, range of things, you know. Um, for those of you who like sushi, who like raw fish, you definitely want to try Korea's take on on um, on sushi and sashimi especially tamtihe is the tuna those these are it's tuna um, tuna sushi tuna sashimi and in Korea there are restaurants that do a really good high quality all you can eat tuna sashimi and you will get cuts of tuna you will never get in an American sushi or sashimi restaurant and kinds of tuna that they don't even have in, on American menus. Skipjack and albacore and yellowfin and bluefin and the belly button, the belly button, which I, I'm like, oh, they have a belly button. I guess they do <laughs> according to the menu. So parts of the much more interesting parts with a different chew and a different texture than the usual bluefin or yellowfin slices that you get. So yeah, Tom Tihe is definitely a recommendation and I can't type in this laptop right now. 
um, sorry, I can't type in this laptop right now in Korean. It's kind of a bit of a pain to change it. And I don't know what the letters are actually uh, once I do change it. So I apologize for that. But Tam Tihei and these restaurants, if you look up tuna sashimi restaurant in Korea, it'll, it'll, it'll point you at the one at, at, at such restaurants. And you can often get all you can eat and they come with lots of side dishes, really interesting side dishes, some, you know, cooked, not just raw meat, raw fish and, you know, soup and that sort of thing. So definitely a must try in Korea. And then of course there's kimbap. For those of you who don't know kimbap, kimbap is, um, it's, it is, Kim uh, actually means nor means seaweed laver, like nori in Japanese. The the laver that's kim and bot means rice, and so it's it's literally you know the nori the seaweed wrapped around rice with stuff inside of it. And the Korean take on it is very flavorful because they use sesame oil and other sauces on the inside that just and on the outside too because they actually paint sesame oil, brush sesame oil onto the kim, onto the nori. So I can really recommend kimbap. It is it is the go-to um, hiking food, actually. We will always get a couple of rolls of kimbap and they sell them at the convenience stores. And the convenience store kimbap is actually pretty damn good. And it's very inexpensive and it's very filling and it's well balanced because there'll be the nor the the sea the laver which is the seaweed which of course is very nutrient dense and there'll be the f the vegetable fillings and you know maybe some kind of protein depending on what kind of kimbap you get because just like with maki in Japanese cuisine there's all sorts of kimbap and the convenience stores sell it and it's pretty good and it's always fresh because it <laughs> because Ever, it's gone sold out by the end of the day. So kimbap that you get at convenience store will always be fresh that morning. And that's what we like to take with us on hikes is actually kimbap because it's shelf stable, it's easy to eat with your hands and inexpensive and it's filling. So it meets all of the criteria for hike, good hiking food. Um, it's, there's something lovely about sitting up on top of a Korean mountain with a view of the valley eating your kimbap in the silence of nature, or if you're lucky in the silence of nature, because Korean mountains tend to be really crowded with a lot of people. People here love hiking, and actually the average age of people hiking the mountains here is like 60, and that's the average age. There, I have not encountered many young people on mountains here. It is usually the leisurely set of retirees. So you are probably going to be, you know, not alone on mountains here. <laughs> and that's fine, that's fine. So there are some suggestions for foodstuffs. Um, another, some other, another question I had was, well, what to see? Korea is so rich with sites of uh, cultural and historical importance that, um, oh, and if you're joining us, sorry, I just saw someone joined in. If you are joining us and you have questions, please do pop them in the chat window and I will get to them in due course. Um, yeah, so, you know, Korea has such a range of cultural, historical, and technological sites to see. Korea is a crazy combination of ancient history that it, that it proudly explores and displays, but also extremely highly developed sophisticated technological civilization so in the same day you can go hiking in the mountains visit a 15th century palace and then go up to the top of one of the tallest skyscrapers in the world in the same day without very much effort that's Seoul by the way you can do all of that in Seoul if you plan your day if you if you regiment your day you can actually get all of those things in so it's very easy to get a mixed sort of vacation here. You don't have to pick, oh, I want a mountain vacation or I want a city vacation or I want, I want, I want a historic, you know, I want cultural, cultural sites. I want a cultural vacation. You know, often when you go places, you have to pick one of those, maximum two of those. But in a place like Korea, you can get all of those things. So, um, yeah, in, in Seoul, of course, everyone... God, whenever I'm talking to people, they nearly always say, oh, I'm going to Seoul. I'm like, okay, well, that's great. And Seoul is, mistake me not, really amazing. There's a reason so many people live there. Oh, I apologize. I just sniffed very loudly. I inhaled something and it's making my nose run, a piece of dust or something. Anyway, um, there is a reason that everyone goes to Seoul. 
and that is because it, it is. It's it's got it has it has medieval royal palaces. It has 19th century royal palaces. You can rent clothing, traditional Korean clothing, and wander around the palaces and like like this, like this chogori, but with like all the chima and everything. Um, you can go eat at a huge variety of restaurants from traditional Korean palace cuisine through to fusion, through to the most esoteric sort of dining experiences you can imagine. Like you can do all of that in Seoul. I never have to get a car because there's a metro. But there is so much beyond Seoul as well. Um, in Suwon, which is a city south of Seoul, there's an amazing preserved Joseon era fortress. So like 18th century uh, city wall, the entire ramparts of the city wall, perfectly preserved. And you can walk the whole thing. It's like a six mile walk amazing view of the city and then there's this palace inside of the walls you can go visit and it's, it's actually been outfitted with furniture unlike the the palaces in Seoul which are mostly vacant but this palace in Suwon get that here Suwon fortress so called Hwasong which actually just means fortress um, the the palace there which was a retreat for the Joseon royalty when they would go to uh, perform funerary rites, uh, not funerary rites, ancestral rites, because there were ancestral tombs there. Um, so that palace has actually been reconstructed and outfitted properly. So you can see how a royal palace looked when it was actually in use versus now where it's sort of empty of what it once was. Um, yeah, so that's Suwon. And if you are in Seoul, that's an easy train ride. It's a 30 minute Mugungwa train ride, that's the slow train. I think it's a 20 minute high speed train ride and um, you can take the metro. The metro is actually like an hour, so I wouldn't recommend the metro. I'd recommend one of the other options to Suwon. And then it's, you know, the actual access to the walls is like half a mile from the train station, so you can just walk to it and then walk all the way around and just enjoy these amazing views. But like the Great Wall of China, Korean medieval and historic city walls, they go up and down the mountains and hills entirely. So there will be serious, serious climbing involved. So don't, don't expect it to be like medieval European cities where the walls are kind of all even, right? City ramparts, very flat, very even. Not in Asia <laughs> and definitely not in Korea. So it will, be, it will be a hike. It will be a real walk, not just a gentle Sunday stroll but it's worth it. Suwon is beautiful. Then going further down the line, you have Jeonju. And Jeonju is an amazingly well-preserved historic city. So for those who don't know, brief, brief bit of recent history. During the Korean War, the city was basically the city, the country, the peninsula was more or less raised to the ground because there was fighting from north to south, south to north, north to south, south to the midpoint. And they just, everything went up in flames, whether accidentally or on purpose. So what that means is not much has survived from before the Korean War. But Jeonju is one of the few places whose historic old town actually did survive with the traditional, we're called Hanok, which literally means like Korean building. <laughs> but the Hanok in their the beautiful traditional Korean homes have survived with the tiny little narrow lanes that are definitely too narrow for modern cars. And also there is the ancestral shrine for the first king of Joseon, Tejo. Um, the founder of the dynasty, because that is where the Yi family comes from, is there, the Yi family of Jeonju. <laughs> and so you can go visit that ancestral shrine, which is hundreds of years old itself, and sort of feels like a sort of, to, to the uncasual viewer, it would feel very similar to the palaces, except that it's not painted that way. But beautiful historic site. And so you can go in Jeonju and again rent traditional Korean hanbo and walk around these old historic neighborhoods feeling like you're stepping back in time. And there's all these hands-on experiences there. You can do different kinds of traditional Korean crafts and usually very inexpensively because it's all sponsored by uh, Korea, Korea tourism. So yeah, Donju is definitely a recommended stop along the way. And then Kyongju is another amazing historic city that is an absolute must-see. 
Now, some parts, the, the old, the old part of one of the old parts, one of the old Joseon parts did survive. That village has survived. Um, it's called, I forget what it's called, something Creek Village. Anyway, there's also a traditional, there's an, a medieval Confucian Academy there that's still functioning. You can go visit that there. Um, you know, 400, 500 years old, 600 years old. Although I'm pretty certain it was burnt down during the Imjin War, 1592, when Japan tried to invade Korea unsuccessfully, um, but still burnt everything to the ground and then rebuilt. But it has been rebuilt, and that's still hundreds of years old. And the village that's around it is just beautiful and scenic, and again narrow winding lanes with you know the walls and the beautiful traditional homes and. But beside that, Gyeongju was once the ancient, the capital of the ancient kingdom that was Korea, the Shila dynasty. And the Shila dynasty was known beyond Korea as the kingdom of gold because they so loved gold and had so much of it and made so many accessories out of gold that it was just known as kind of the shining city on the hill. And Gyeongju, um, to this day has, they've rebuilt some of the pal one of the palaces, the Pleasure Palace, Wolji, Wolji Pond, Anapji, Tonggung, the Eastern Palaces it's called, just stunning at nighttime especially. I'll write that here. Anapji, Tonggung, Gyeongju Palace. Um, an absolute must, you must visit that. And they've also built, rebuilt a bridge a stunning bridge from the 7th century that is known in English as the Bridge of Filial Non-Filial Piety. <laughs> because the legend goes that the king built the bridge uh, for his mother, who was a widow, so that she could go visit her lover on the other side, in the village on the other side of the river. And so the filial piety part is that he did this for his mother. The non-filial piety part, or the filial non-piety part, is that he is dishonoring the memory of his father because, of course, women are ex were expected, once widowed, to stay faithful to their dead husbands by neither remarrying nor taking lovers. So <laughs> it's a fun, fun little story, but the bridge is magically stunning, both in daytime and at nighttime. Um, and Gyeongju also has these stunning pyramid-sized, ancient Egyptian pyramid-sized hill graves, tumuli, that are just covered in beautiful grass, but they are immense. And there's like 350 of them in the city because in Kyung, when Gyeongju, which was not called Gyeongju back then, its name, its historic name is escaping me at the moment. But in the Shila dynasty, they buried royalty and puissant nobles and warriors in these immense hill graves. And many of them have survived and or been rebuilt since then. And they've excavated some of these tombs and found the most amazing gold grave goods you can imagine. And those are in the museum in Gyeongju. Um, so Gyeongju is worth a walk at night and then another walk at daytime, or excuse me, a walk at daytime, and then a walk at night when all of the hill graves are illuminated, the palace is illuminated, the bridge is illuminated, the village is illuminated, the mystical forest where the, you know, first king of Shilo is supposedly born from an egg in a tree. Um, yeah, there's all kinds of fun. <laughs> Korean mythology is filled with people being born <laughs> from eggs in weird places. <laughs> <laughs> One of them was an egg laid by a horse. I think that's the, actually the first king of the Shila dynasty, the founding king of the Shila dynasty. His origin story is that he was born from an egg laid by a horse. Just don't, don't get me started on the biology there. Um, but in Gyeongju, they also, in the afternoon, in the morning and the afternoon, do a royal procession where you actually can see in real life the, the sort of clothing and this musical style of a royal Sheila procession, the so first millennium era clothing and music, and there's someone who's pr playing the queen, Queen Sondok, in in the palanquin and being borne through the whole you know old palace area. So, Gyeongju, absolute must see. Excuse me, and then of course um, there's Busan, which is the southernmost city in Korea, and. Um, it's the second largest city, but it has a completely different feel from Seoul. Seoul is filled with, cult it's a highly competitive place. 
cult in terms of business. You know, there's a lot of stress <laughs> um, amongst people in Seoul about their jobs. Um, and but Pusan is very different. It is. It has a different feel. Everyone seems happier there. They seem more relaxed. They seem more laid back. Um, and generally just friendlier, like, and I, people, it's not that people in Seoul are unfriendly, but the people in Busan just seem more open. And Busan is right on the beach. So it has, you know, amazing beaches, Haeundae Beach, and um, they've actually taken the old train, the, the old train track that used to run along the coast, and it's no longer a train track, they've turned it into a hiking trail, walking trail, biking trail. So you can walk right along the coastline, I mean right along the crashing waves for miles and miles and miles. And so that's wonderful. The beach, sandy beach is nice. There's all kinds of coastal hikes down there in Busan. Um, uh, Igede, Igede Point is one of them. Um, you're literally walking on the, like, on boardwalks on top of the crashing waves under the rocks, and the views are just absolutely stunning. And the legend behind Igede Point is that during the Imjin War, when the Japanese were trying to invade, the Japanese, um, some, some of the local gisang, the courtesan entertainers, uh, hosted a fete for the Japanese leadership, military leadership, and they actually ho held it on top of one of the cliffs overlook that is now Igede Point um, and to show their devotion to their people and the kingdom they actually three of them wrapped themselves around the three top leading generals of the Japanese army and launched themselves to their deaths in the sea taking them with them by the way in Joseon that was how you became a virtuous woman got the official title yeah you had to do it through death I don't think I need to say anything more about that Anyway, um, yeah, so Igede Point is supposedly the place where that happened, but <laughs> that, that sort of morose heroism aside, it is a stunning, stunning place and a beautiful walk. Now again, <laughs> it's Korea. There, is, there are very few places where your walk is going to be entirely level, so there's lots of stairs, lots of stairs up and down and up and down. So it is a rigorous walk um, and definitely not accessible at all. So if you, if you need mobility devices, EGDA Point is not for you, sadly. But the train, the railroad walk that I mentioned that starts at Hyundai Beach and goes kind of east, north, east, northeastward is, is very accessible. I can't, thinking back on it, I can't really remember any spot where you couldn't access it in a wheelchair or other mobility device. So that's more accessible. And Busan um, has mountains right there, and so there's this beautiful, um, beautiful mountain fortress, another medieval fortress, but on top of the mountain, mountain walk that's just mystical and magical. And up there in that mountain in Busan, you can get black goat meat. Black goat meat is the dish you want to try there because the people up there on those mountains, the traditional... Um, livestock that they raise are black goats and so you can get really good black goat meat in the black goat village <laughs> that is up there if you do a google search you'll you will find it um yeah so other than that busan is also a big city with all the big city amenities it's a very international city so you can get all sorts of cuisines there not just korean cuisine you can also get buddhist temple cuisine there um indian kazakh kazakh Kazaki, uh, all sorts of, you know, because it's a port city. And so lots of restaurants have opened to cater to the employees from abroad who work in the international harbor there. So yeah, Busan, big, beautiful international city. Um, probably the biggest food thing there though is, is going to be the fish market, the Busan fish market. At the Busan fish market is probably where you can get some of the best sashimi in Korea, and a dish you definitely want to try there is hei dok bap. bap, which is basically like bim bim bap, but with raw fish in the middle of it. So hei dok bap is your friend. If you like raw fish, if you like rice, if you like mixed vegetable thingies, and all of that sounds good together, um, then hei dok bap is your baby, and you can get superb hei dok bap at the fish market in Busan. And Busan, there's the high-speed train from Busan to Seoul takes three hours. 
No kidding. It is super fast. If not, if not like two hours and 45 minutes, actually, now that I think maybe two and a half hours, the super fast train. The fast trains here are fast and it's cheap. I, you can, I think it's 60,000 won from end to end. So that's like $45 high speed train ticket for, for a 300 something kilometer ride. Like you can't even go that far. I mean, yeah. Um, no, let's not get me started on on <laughs> Amtrak prices. It's not Amtrak's fault necessarily. Obviously, Covrail is heavily subsidized by the Korean government, and Amtrak is nowhere near as subsidized. But anyway, yeah. So you can get to Gyeongju, you can get to Suwon and Gyeongju, and Busan on the high speed train. Jeonju, you can take the high speed train as far as Daejeon, and then I think in Daejeon you'll have to change to a milk train, uh, the Mugunghwa, the the old trains that are they're still comfortable. Really, they are. They're still. Com they're actually in some ways more comfortable because the seats are actually bigger than the seats on the high-speed train on the KTX. But it's slower. It is slower, so it will take you longer. That's not necessarily a bad thing if you're not in a rush. You can see some really beautiful countryside. I mean, I often just sit in the train and just stare out at the gorgeous countryside as we pass through hills and mountains and fields and forests and see temples up on the hill or medieval fortresses up on the hills, just beautiful pagodas sitting out there looking very idyllic. So the train itself can be fun just for the ride because it's a clean, air-conditioned, comfortable, smooth ride going through really beautiful, beautiful landscapes. Okay, um, so are there any other questions? Um, Otherwise, I think I've covered m most of the questions I had. Oh, where to stay, right. Okay, last thing, where to stay. Anywhere you go in Korea these days, we have the fortune that traditional Korean style houses, buildings have been rebuilt. For a long time, there were very few Hanok, and those are the beautiful traditional Korean homes, right. There were very few because most of them just burnt down like that during the war, yay warfare. But in the last 10 years, many people have seen the value in rebuilding them and, and using them and living in them and renting out rooms as bed and breakfast. So you can look, if you do a search for Hanok on Airbnb and the city where you want to go, you will get lots of hits where you can, you can spend as little as $60 a night to stay in a traditional Korean hanok anywhere. Whether it's Seoul, in Seoul the neighborhood is probably going to be Bukchon. In Seoul you'll be staying looking for uh, Bukchon, which literally means uh, North Creek. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, you can, you'll probably be staying in Bukchon, which is sandwiched right, the, the village or the neighborhood sandwiched right between the two main royal palaces in Seoul. And um, in Gyeongju, there's hanoks everywhere now. There's lots of them, and you can really stay in beautiful properties. Now, you're going to be sleeping on the floor on a pretty thin futon, um, and the walls between the rooms are not particularly thick because it's traditional architecture. It wasn't designed for privacy. So, you know, there are some inconveniences perhaps you might consider if you're a light sleeper bring earplugs. <laughs> um, but otherwise, I really do recommend staying in a hanok because they also tend to offer a traditional Korean breakfast, which could be bean bean bop or a lovely soup like tenjan jjigae, which is um, like a tofu, a tofu soup, or maybe um, abalone porridge. So, you know, there's you're going to get a lovely breakfast included with that. A really great, healthy way to start the day, well-balanced nutritionally, um, low, in, you know, high in healthy fats, low in unhealthy fats, that sort of thing, low in carbohydrates, relatively speaking, um, or at least in refined ones. So, yeah, um, that is my recommendation for stays in Korea now. There's also thousands upon thousands of hotels here. Um, Agoda.com is a good place to search for, actually for Hanok stays as well, um, Airbnb and Agoda. Airbnb has the disadvantage that, of course, there's always that stupid cleaning fee. Agoda.com has no cleaning fees, right? It doesn't have any of the hidden fees that Airbnb has. 
Um, so yeah, those are my two recommendations. I would look on a go to first and if you don't find anything that you like there, then go to Air switch to Airbnb. And if you're a large party, you can rent entire hanoks sometimes for relatively little money. In Gyeongju, we've managed to rent, um, you know, a three bedroom, immense living room, full kitchen sort of establishment hanok for uh, $340 a night, which, you know, is pretty good when considering that it sleeps like 10 people <laughs> and then you have your own kitchen you can cook in and uh, your own space living area space and it's all enclosed anyway uh so that i think is it if you are watching this oh wait uh checking over my list one more app um very useful app to have this but takes us back to transport cacao taxi um, and this is part of the cacao <laughs> the cacao suite of apps. Cacao Talk is the communication app instead of WhatsApp, they have Cacao Talk here. Cacao Talk. And then Cacao Taxi. Cacao Taxi is a great app for calling taxis. In fact, it's almost impossible to get a taxi mid-street anymore without it because everyone uses the app, so there's no more taxis just floating around without people in them. So Cacao Taxi is great because it identifies where you are. The taxi will come to exactly where you are. You don't have to tell them where you are. You can tell how far out they are. You can communicate with them. So it's like Uber, but um, and it'll also tell you how much it will be. It's like Uber, but without any of the kind of baggage that may come with Uber. Um, it's still, you're still taxi, it's still a taxi. Um, and you don't have to worry about tips. You know, this Korea is not a tipping culture, by the way. People just get paid the amount of money they should to do the job. It's not like America where, you know, the onus is put on the customer to make sure that employees are paid properly. Yeah, don't get me started on that. Anyway. So that's my final tip for traveling in Korea or even living in Korea. Cacao Taxi is your friend. Um, otherwise, internet is the fastest in the world here. I mean that literally. Many cities have free Wi-Fi just out and about. So if you turn on your Wi-Fi, you'll probably pick it up. All restaurants or almost all restaurants have free Wi-Fi as a matter of course. Many of the trains have free Wi-Fi on them. The metros usually have Wi-Fi service. Um, although usually it's tied to your provider. So if you don't have a Korean uh, cell phone provider, then you probably won't be able to access it. But trains have, CoRail provides free Wi-Fi on their trains. Um, yeah, and uh, for those of you who are coming from America, possibly from Europe, if you have T-Mobile, if you have a T-Mobile phone, you probably have free international roaming. Double check to make sure your contract is covered by that. But most T-Mobile, um, the most standard T-Mobile contracts these days come with free international roaming, free Wi-Fi or free internet, free mobile data in like 200 countries. Um, not, I <laughs> found out that uh, Ethiopia is not one of them, by the way. Uh, Togo is, <laughs> bizarrely, but not Ethiopia. But Korea is one of them. And you get a certain amount of 5G for free. And then after that, it slows down to 256 kilobytes per second for the month. But you te um, text messaging is free and calls are only 25 cents a minute if you really need to make a call, which is really, really decent rate for a cell phone call international long distance. Anyway, um, I guess that's it. So if you have any questions, if you're watching this as a recording, first off, thank you for getting this far. If you have any questions, drop them in the comments below and I will definitely answer them. Otherwise, everyone, have a lovely evening, morning, or afternoon, wherever it is, or whatever it is, wherever you are. And may your travels be creative. Until next time, bye everyone.